Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Philip Security's morning re uh, research call today. I'm Wee Kwang, and today we will be covering um, BRC Asia's initiation as well as results for IX Biopharma, first sponsor group, Prime US REIT, Comfort Dell Grow, as well as Star Hub. And then we also have uh, Singapore REITs Monthly as well as SG Weekly. So without further ado, I will begin with IX Biopharma's results. Next. Next. Okay, for IX Biopharma's results, um, the positive, uh, we have seen that their revenue uh, has achieved a very strong growth beyond year, 182% year on year, um, with both positive contribution from specialty pharmaceutical products as well as nutraceuticals. Um, for specialty pharmaceutical, we saw that um, the growth is a little bit slower compared to nutraceuticals, partially due to the fact that um, Australia continue to uh, suffer from sp sporadic lockdowns. I think even now, I think they just exited one lockdown and we do not know when the next one will be because they do not have a very comprehensive plan in terms of their lockdown uh, measures. And what happened is that um, for IX Biopharma, who launched their medicinal cannabis line last year, April, um, what happened is that... Uh, oh, sorry. I Okay, I'll, I'll try to uh, speak a bit louder. Let me know if it's clear enough. Um, for... Okay, so for, for their new product, product Sativa, when they launched last April, usually what these prescription drugs will need is that they need training and they need orientation for the prescription from the company itself. However, due to the lockdowns, um, for the sales activities by IX Biopharma to these clinics and hospitals are unable to happen because the clinics and hospitals will just take in patients. They won't usually see um, sales representatives from companies like them. What have, so this kind of impeded their sales for the first half, uh, first half of 2021. And um, pharmacies as well, they saw lower footfall from, from people visiting in general. Um, for nutraceuticals, however, we saw that there was a very strong growth, 267% year on year, um, especially because they moved their sales channel online to, through to China from Tmall as well as JD.com. In particular, um, Luminix, their skincare supplement product, um, is, is a very strong growth product there. And for the first half of 2021, uh, part particularly heartening is also their anti-aging supplement, is NAD products, uh, Restorix and Metabolics. And what is interesting about this Restorix and Metabolics, it actually is not a wafer um, product from IX Biopharma. We know that IO5, uh, IX Biopharma, sorry, um, their main... Um, attraction is that they have this uh, wafer delivery system that helps to absorb um, your, your, your drugs that you take in faster. However, for these, these are actually pill products, but because the NAD product itself, um, the NAD component is actually very novel in the market. Not many um, health supplements actually give you NAD on its own. So this is something that actually captures the, a lot of demand from the China side. And it is not limited by their freeze dryer capacity. What we know is that for IX Biopharma, a lot of their uh, limitations come from them having a very fixed production capacity currently. And in terms of others, if you take a look at the table on the left-hand side, the bottom red um, box, we can see that their other income actually grew by two million, more than $2 million is due to the currency translation effect from the appreciation of Australian dollar in the first half of 2021. Next. In terms of negatives, um, we saw that for them, the, the downside to them, their business model currently is that they are still experiencing a negative margin. Even though we saw that um, gross margins actually fell from negative 57% to negative 16%. So with the sales run rate for that they experienced in um, first half of 2021, which is from July to December, was actually stronger and higher than what they saw in the fourth quarter uh, in the fourth quarter of uh, 2020, uh, similar run rates. Um, yeah, uh, and this will this will you see this current margin continue to narrow throughout the remainder of the financial year itself. However, um, what we do note is that they actually intended for their increase in production capacity to uh, happen in the first uh, at the start of the year, um, 2021, uh, which is in a January. However, there is some delays in the installation process because I think they were shipping something from the US and they were delayed due to supply chain uh, disruptions. And as a result, they are only expecting the, the additional capacity to come online, um, to only come online uh, in April. And what happens is that the commercial impact, which is the impact to their revenues, will only come in in financial year 2022, which is after June this year. Next. 
Okay, in terms of outlook, we see that um, COVID-19 pandemic continues to be a disruption for them, apart from the fact that the supply chain disruption kind of caused them uh, some sales, will probably cause them some sales in the sense that their production capacity increment will be delayed. Um, they also have a deal that is hinging on the fact that um, the potential uh, partners will be able to enter into Australia. And we, like I mentioned before, uh, with the sporadic lockdowns in Australia, it is very hard for them to actually come to conclusion of a deal. So they do have a lot of uh, partners now. Uh, however, this is, this is uh, being kind of put on hold. Um, and of course, they, the industry right now is all dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, there's a lot of rationalizing among the big farmers that are trying to get this in licensing from IX Biopharma. So for IX Biopharma, it is not uh, it is more of a trade-off between whether they want to rush a deal right now or they can wait out a little bit longer and they, can, they might actually get a better deal when the global uh, economy turns around and the uh, big farmers actually have more spending power. And secondly, in terms of um, for IX Biopharma, the way uh, intellectual property remains to be the jewel in the crown for them. Uh, we see that they are continuing their R&D uh, for some of their, their, their products in terms of the medicinal cannabis range. And also in the future, what is, a, what is a good potential for them apart from licensing their products is that they can actually license their technology outwards to create even, uh, even more new products. What happens is that, uh, for example, um, if a, 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 an interested party were to approach them and say that, oh, you know, we are interested in this technology and we want to create a certain product, uh, what IX Biopharma will do is that they can actually undertake these initial phases of research and development to see whether the, the, the product they have is viable and all these costs will be borne by the interested parties themselves. And this is a very huge potential for uh, sales growth in the future for IX Biopharma. In terms of recommendation, we are maintaining our buy call with a lower target price of 44.5 cents uh, from the slightly lower from the previous 45.5 cents. This is because we actually cut our... Um, financial year 2021 earnings by $9.5 million. Uh, first of all, $1.5 million, we are expecting it due to the sales loss because of the delayed production capacity increase. And we actually defer the remaining $8 million in upfront out licensing fee of the wafermin to financial year 2022. So of course, the deal will be a much larger sum, just that um, at the onset, when they actually sign a deal, what IX Biopharma will get is actually an upfront uh, out licensing fee for them. And the outlook for profitability remains intact for IX Biopharma, especially once um, the COVID-19 disruptions are over. Uh, what we see is that right now for Australia itself, things are turning around as they start their vaccination um, program. So, so we are expecting things to turn around for them pretty soon. And that's it from me for IX Biopharma. I'll now hand the time over to Terence for BRC Asia's initiation. Uh, thanks, Rui Guang, and good morning, everyone. We initiated coverage on BRC Asia with a buy recommendation and a target price of $1.87 based on 11 times financial year 21 PE. So in this slide, we provide an overview of BRC Asia's business. Uh, BRC Asia is the largest steel reinforcement supplier in Singapore with a dominating 70% market share. So you can see we provided uh, the, these two tables below. We provided a uh, uh, snapshot of their market share uh, for, for 2017. You can see like, it's a little bit dated, uh, 2017, uh, but, but that's because we don't have the latest data. This, this 2017 uh, data was actually provided by the company to the Competition Commission of Singapore when they acquired uh, Lee Metal in 2017. Uh, unfortunately, there's no more latest data like, because, because the, the, mo most of the, the companies here are all, all private. So to, to get this industry data, you really need to speak to them. But we understand that there's uh, no, no more, th th that this is relatively still relatively unchanged. Uh, so 70% market share is like almost uh, more than two thirds of the market already. Yep. Uh, they have operations in, uh, for BRC, they have operations in Singapore, Malaysia, and China. Uh, and Singapore is their main market. You can see this in the 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 right chart, the, the chart on the right. Singapore is uh, eighty four and a half percent of their overall revenue for financial year twenty. So they have a total manufacturing capacity of one point two million metric tons a year. In our next slide, uh, we cover our uh, we highlight the three investment theses uh, of BRC Asia. Firstly, we expect record earnings of 42 million and 45 million for FY 2021 and FY 2022, respectively. 
uh, our second investment thesis is we expect construction demand, which we know collapsed in uh, FY20 to recover to about 23 to 28 billion in 2021, uh, recovering from the 21.3 billion in 2020. Uh, you can you can see we uh, again this this table we we provide on the the the, the bottom left hand corner. Uh, you can see the construction demand uh, really fell uh, quite drastically in, in 2020 uh, because of the COVID pandemic la. But then for 2021, uh, through to even 2024, they, they do expect construction um, demand to 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 increase. So we think there are huge market share of 70%, uh, more than two thirds of the market. Uh, when in, in terms of providing steel, means BRC is well positioned to capitalize on the growth. Uh, last but not least, we see the potential for the dividend payout to recover from FY21 and FY22. We, we'll, we'll talk more about this, this, this shortly. But first, in our next slide, we provide that a summary of their first quarter financial year 21. Uh, results on the summary table on the left. You can see the for you can you can probably go through this table uh, on your own. But I think what we want to highlight here is the the no pet the the net profit uh, attributable to equity holders in the first quarter of FY twenty one. It's first quarter because yeah year end is September. Uh, they actually uh, reported nine point six million. Uh, in in net profit after tax. So actually, you just do a, a back of the envelope calculation, you can see that you, it's not hard to hit 42 million. If you take this as first quarter as a run rate, let's take 9.6 times 4. So you, you can see 42 million is definitely achievable. But of course, this is contingent on uh, what they are uh, the COVID pandemic in, in situation uh, in Singapore, if it, if, it, if it remains at this level and we think that there's, a, there's a good chance that it will, then uh, we, we think they can hit 42 million for this year and 45 million for next year. So 42 million for FY 2021 means that they are currently only trading about 11, 10 to 11 times PE only at these levels. So uh, with, with a current order book of about a billion uh, uh, dollars. Uh. Okay, so in our next slide, uh, we have a table on the left that shows the historical dividend payout for the group. Uh, and even though the group has a fixed dividend policy of 30%, uh, you can see that they've been paying out a special dividend for the last two years. Uh, for even, even for last year, financial year 20 during the pandemic, they also paid out a special dividend. That means the dividend payout is about uh, has ranged between 59% to 69%. Uh, for financial year 21 and financial year 22, we have conservatively kept it about 30%, which is their fixed uh, dividend policy rate. But if, we, but if we take the midpoint of their dividend payout in the last two years, uh, we are potentially looking at a payout of 10 and 11 Singapore cents, which translates to a respectable dividend yield of 6.3% and 6.9% respectively. Uh, so, 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 that, so, so, so it's quite attractive lah, for this. For, so for our last slide, uh, we cover the valuation on BRC Asia. Our valuation on BRC Asia is actually based on 11 times of uh, financial year 21 PE. And this is a 15% discount to their 10 year historical average PE on account of the uncertain environment. The, the, obviously the COVID environment is still, still affecting the, the construction industry. Uh, so you can see this discount uh, is based on the 10-year average PE at about 13 times in the graph below. You can see this graph, we, we, we actually put a graph below here. Like you can see the average PE they've been trading since 2010. Uh, is, it average is about 13 times, uh, but we, our, our, our target price actually does 11 times. Um, and, and also in our view, we think BRC Asia should trade at a higher premium to their historical PE, la, especially after the acquisition of Lee Metal three years ago, because the acquisition of Lee Metal three years ago actually consolidated and strengthened their position, market position considerably. Like that's just to recap, about more than two thirds of market share in Singapore. So almost all the, the construction steel reinforcement works in Singapore, about more than two thirds will be provided by them. So we believe BRC Asia then is a key beneficiary of the construction rebound in Singapore and initiate coverage on them with a buy recommendation and a target price of $1.87. I'll now hand over the time to Chie Kui, who will cover first sponsor. Chie Kui, over to you. Great. Um, thanks, Darren. Uh, first, we have our full year results from first sponsor. Yeah, so starting with the negatives first, um, it, was, it wasn't really a strong quarter for them, as you can tell from the 4Q numbers. The revenue was down by 74% year on year and gross profit was down by 50%. This is largely due to the lack of income um, generated from the property development and the hotel segment. 
FY20 results are similar, but a hell lot better. Um, gross profit um, is in line with our expectation at 95% of our forecast, but all in all, um, FY20 um, net profit was 28% below our expectations. This is due to um, a loss from associates and JBs, as well as a lot of other gains as compared to a year before. FSG also saw a defaulted PRC loan during the quarter as a borrower group from, um, sorry, as a borrower group with two collateralized um, loans was in arrears for one month's interest for eight months since March 2020. Sorry, give, just give me a moment. Oh, uh, sorry. So, uh, okay, so what this means is that he's consistently paying. So, because this boss is now on hand with an islander to get first. In uh, sorry, can you hear me? Um, sorry, let me just repeat. Okay, so um, first sponsor saw a defaulted PRC loan during the quarter um, as a borrower group with two cost collateralized loans was in arrears for one month's interest for eight months since um, March 2020. So what this means is that um, he's consistently paying interest on the loan, on the loan, but it's always one month late. So um, because this borrower has another loan on hand with another lender, um, first sponsor doesn't want to, um, didn't want to take the business risk and took action in order to get first interest on um, the collateralized properties in November 2020. Yeah, so um, these loans were secured on properties with a combined LTV of 53.4%. And in view of the successes dealing with defaults previously, as well as um, through ongoing discussions with the borrower, first sponsor is optimistic about um, the recovery exercise. Now moving to the positive, um, in full year 20, first sponsor has only recognized profits from four commercial units and um about 4,000 um, car park lots this year, which resulted in a 64% dip in full year revenue collected from the sale of properties. This means that um, the property development revenue and um, GDV that we, that we anticipated to be recognized this um, last year is likely to be recognized this year. So as a gauge, um, first sponsor actually recognizes unrecognized revenue from property development through contract liabilities. Contract liabilities in their balance sheet increased 9.5 times year on year to 372 million in FY20, and these are only for um, projects that are on books, like the Pinnacle and um, plot, plot F of um, Chantu Millennium, uh, Millennium Waterfront. So um, this actually has not accounted for the potential GDV for the projects that are going to be recognized at um, the associates level, like the Star of the East River and the Emerald of the Orient. Therefore, we are looking at record pre-tax pre profit in um, FY21. Next, please. Yeah, so in terms of their segmented outlook, um, the Tongkwan property market is still robust. Um, 2020 home prices in Tongkwan rose the most in China by 29%. Most of um, fun, uh, most of the sponsors' existing properties, uh, sorry, ex existing projects are de-risked um, as they are either sold and awaiting handovers or kept for a minimum holding period for, uh, yeah, for a certain number of years. So um, first sponsor actually took on new projects to capitalize on the positive outlook of the Greater Bay Area. And together with two new projects and the rise in average selling prices, the total unrecognized property development sales rose from, um, from almost 600 million to 935 million. Gross, de gross development value for unlocking increased from 1.9 billion to 4.1 billion. Separately, um, the construction for phase 1.1 of human uh, TOD project has begun. So we are expecting the completion to bring in about 230 million of gross development value upon handover in 2022 to 2023. And um, for the hotel segment, it's likely to remain weak. Occupancies for um, first ones operating hotels decreased significantly quarter on quarter due to COVID-19 resurgence and a drop in demand post summer holidays. The performance of hotels are currently held up by um, government wage subsidies as well to FY21. So if they are no longer available, the hotel performance may be further impacted. Uh, next, please. So lastly, the property financing business is still stable. Um, FY20 property financing revenue grew by 20% year on year on the back of um, China's tighter credit, credit environment. A new loan was dispersed in December 2020. And we believe that first sponsor will benefit from the growing request for alternative um, funding sources amid yeah, lower, fis lower fiscal spending and tighter controls on um, property developers. 
sorry, uh, maybe I can speak a bit softer. So um, that's it. Uh, first sponsor will also be selective about the loans they are going to take on. So overall, we maintain a buy rating for first sponsor at an unchanged target price of $1.56. We mark down our valuations for hotels and we categorize some of our investment properties to other investments. However, we increase our we decrease our um, SOTP discount from 30% to 20% to reflect first sponsor's upcoming property developments as well as its well-supported outlook. So this is all for first sponsor. I'll move on to Prime. Yeah. So um, next please. Okay, so for Prime, generally was another resilient quarter for them. The results were largely in line with expectations. Net property income and DPU outperformed IPO forecast due to the acquisition made earlier in the year. But in terms of the half-year numbers you can see from the table, um, it has largely been stable. And this is due to high rental collection rates at 99% and minimal deferrals granted to tenants. The second positive for them um, is in terms of, of their leasing strength and minimal expiries. In FY20, um, Prime signed about 200 square feet of leases at positive rental reversions of 7.2%. More than 60% of it were renewals or, for, or expansions by existing tenants. And um, the, minimal the minimal expiries coming up also help to provide greater visibility of Prime's income stream over the next two years. The leases that are expiring um, in FY21 are actually well spread across its properties with no contribution above 1.5% of cash rental income. The last positive for, uh, for Prime will be the portfolio's valuation. So it actually remained largely stable despite COVID-19. The biggest declines come from Tower 1 and Emory View and Promenade 1 and 2. And this was offset by higher valuations for Village Centre 2 and um, 222 Main, which are Prime's biggest assets. So as a result, um, the portfolio valuation actually dipped less than 1%. In terms of negatives, the vacancies that were left last quarter at Village Centre Station 1 and 17th Street are still not filled. So they are operating at below average portfolio occupancy as well. Uh, average portfolio occupancy still remains stable at 92.4%, but as both, property, as both properties are still seeing leasing interest, um, we are attributing the vacancies to longer decision-making by um, prospective tenants, and therefore we lowered our um, FY21 forecast for both properties. Now, in terms of outlook, uh, it's looking better since the, rest, the vaccine rollout. The labor market still continues to reflect the impact of the pandemic and the efforts to contain it. In January, um, US unemployment fell to 6.3%, and given that the unemployment uh, rate in office using sectors like finance remain low, as well as um, professional, professional and business services are seeing notable job gains in January. We are actually more optimistic about, about the recovery of um, US office rates. Even though um, offices are shifting to a hybrid work model, um, prime assets are in markets where upcoming supply will be limited in the next two years. So except for Salt Lake, Salt Lake, Salt Lake City, um, the bulk of upcoming supply uh, has been pre-leased releasing in Salt Lake City has only just begun. So, um, yeah, we believe that most of Prime's markets are forecasted to benefit from rental, from rental growth in the next 12 months. And with portfolio occupancy of 92.4% higher than um, US Class A office average of 86.8%, we remain confident of the strength of Prime's assets. So in conclusion, we maintain a buy rating for them uh, with a target price of 94 cents. Now I'll move on to net for um, this money. Uh, thank you, Tihui. Okay, so now on to REITs Monday. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so as you can see, all, all three indices actually um, has trended downwards uh, in the last month. Uh, the one-month returns for the, the HTSE REIT index uh, was down by about 5%. Uh, the real estate developer index down by about 6% and the SCI down by 4%. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of dividend yield spread, so um, the light blue line over here, which is the dividend uh, yield, sorry, the, the wheat index price um, has also sort of come down slightly. Uh, in terms of dividend yield spread, the graph below, uh, the dark blue line, which is the dividend yield spread, um, has trended downwards closer towards the negative one standard deviation line. So currently where we are is about 0 0.9, uh, negative 0 0.9 standard deviation level. So this was because of two reasons. Uh, first of all, the lower um, dividend yield uh, for the for the last 12 months as some of the REITs have uh, released their results and the second reason of course would be the increase in the 10-year uh, Singapore bond yield 
So that actually spiked by about 23 uh, basis points month on month. Most of the most of the increase in the 10-year SGS actually came um, post-budget announcement um, as the government announced that they will be uh, sort of tapping, issuing uh, longer dated government bonds through the Singapore bonds to finance big infrastructure projects. In terms of the three months saw, it remained um, largely unchanged. Next slide, please. So in terms of subsector performance, um, uh, still the same. Healthcare and industrial are still the ones that are trading above um, pre-COVID levels, um, followed by retail, commercial and diversified straddle in the middle and then bringing up the rear would be hospitality. Next slide, please. Now we jump into our sub-sector sub um, performance. So for the office sector, uh, in general, the, the rental index um, trended downwards for both the, the central as well as the fringe assets. So for the, for the central assets um, on a full year basis, <coughs> um, the index actually fell by about 5.6 percentage points. <coughs> hey, sorry. Yeah, and, and similar for Sorry, the central index actually fell by nine percentage points, uh, nine percent, as well as the fringe fell by about five five point eight percent, uh, eight point five percent. Okay, so in terms of uh, leasing take up, net island wide absorption was actually negative for the four quarters in uh, FY twenty. However, CBD core net absorption um, was actually positive, uh, zero point two million square feet on a full year basis. So what that actually means is that we are seeing a flight to quality where um, where people uh, people who are located in Great B assets or you know the fringe office assets were actually um, trading up and renting out um, you know better better quality assets in the CBD area. <clears throat> so the CBD area is where most of our REITs have uh, properties and not so much the, the fringe office assets. Okay. Backfilling of space um, sorry backfilling of space uh, was continued um, in, in the fourth quarter. So the 2000 and, uh, 230,000 square feet that was given up by UBS at one of those key is uh, almost 90% committed. So actually 60% has already been committed with another 30% in advanced negotiations. Additionally and separately, ByteDance, which is the Chinese um, tech company, they increased their space uh, leased by about one third. So initially they, they leased 60,000 60, square feet and now they have up upped that amount to 80,000 square feet. So in terms of supply, the CBD stock is um, going to increase by about 2%. So that's about 0 0.9 million square feet in financial year 21. And Capital Spring, uh, which is owned by CM, uh, jointly owned by CMT, uh, CICT, will account for 70% of the new supply. In terms of pre-leasing, 38% um, has been pre-committed with an additional 22% in advanced negotiation. So basically, they're on track um, you know, to hitting a 90% uh, pre-commitment by the time that they open, which is going to be around um, one H, uh, 2 H, uh, 2021. Okay. In, um, there, there's also another mitigating factor, which is that some of the supply will be taken offline um, for redevelopment. So three of the assets that have been confirmed, um, uh, plans have been confirmed for the redevelopment include AXA Tower, uh, Fuji Xerox as well as Central Mall. So altogether, these three assets will take off about 1.2 million square feet of space uh, from the CBD stock. Yeah. And so that will actually almost eliminate the two towers um, you see in the graph over there on the, on the left. It will basically eliminate the, the two supply towers that are coming on for 2021 and 2022. So overall, we still expect leasing to be slightly weaker in the first half of 2021 um, and to pick up uh, in the second half of the year. Next slide, please. Now onto our industrial subsector. Uh, so this is um, basically a health check for the industrial subsector. You see the graph on the left. You can see industrial rents have sort of uh, inched up or rather a little bit. Uh, in terms of your factory, warehouse, and business parks, um, they have increased by about 0 0.2 to 0 0.5 percent, uh, percent quarter on quarter. So this is after 22 um, quarters of decline. So this is a potential bottoming up of bottoming out of um, the, the the rents. In terms of occupancy, it continued to increase quarter on quarter. Uh, looking at the graph on the right right now. <clears throat> so for your business parks, factory and warehouses, the, the quarter on quarter, the occupancy actually increased by about 0 0.3 to 0 0.8 percentage points. Next slide, please. 
So of course, the recovering economic data is also uh, reassuring. Uh, in the December Nordex actually grew by 6.8% year on year, uh, and it brings the full year Nordex growth to 4.3%. The January 20, 2021 PMI uh, was was um, will, will, will be the seventh month of expansion for the PMI index. Yeah. So in terms of supply, uh, looking at the graph on the left, you can see that most of the supply will come on uh, from the flatted factories, which are the light industrial assets. Um, these are the light blue uh, parts of the graph here. So these are, this is where most of the supply is coming on. Okay, and <clears throat> due to the lower amount of pre-commitment, if you look in the table on the left, so the factory stock will actually increase by 3.1%, and factory stock is actually divided into two um, assets, uh, two asset classes, which is, your, which is your light industrial, the light blue area, as well as the high spec. So due to the higher amount of supply coming in um, from the light industrial, as well as the lower pre-commitment levels of 17%, so this light industrial sector uh, may face uh, more, more leasing difficulty. But of course, the government also announced um, in January, February, that, that they, they will be embarking on a 10-year plan to expand Singapore's manufacturing sector by 50%. Uh, yeah, so I guess this will, this will in, the long term, in the mid to long term, actually help to show up demand for, um, the, for industrial assets as well as uh, Singapore's outlook as a manufacturing hub. In terms of data centers, high spec and business parks, the demand uh, remains favorable and they, it, they are supported by um, technology, biomedical and precision engineering sectors. Uh, if you look at the pre-commitment level um, and the new, new supply level, business park stock will increase by about 9.2%, warehouses it will increase by 4.1%. And um, however you look at the pre-commitment level, the business parks are already 63% pre-committed uh, and warehouse, um, they are 27% pre-committed. So of course, needless to say that the warehouses, which have or rather the logistic assets, um, they have actually received quite a bit of demand from third party logistic players throughout the year, as well as initially earlier on um, stockpiling demand. Um, you know, so they, we believe that due to the e-commerce trends, the, there, there might be still more uh, demand from the three PLs. So that sums up our industrial sector. Uh, next slide, please. Now moving on to retail. For, for the retail sector, you can see that the two blue lines in the graph, which are your central and fringe uh, rents, they have dipped lower in the fourth, in the fourth quarter. Um, however, occupancy has ticked up slightly um, by 0.8 percentage uh, points industry-wide. <clears throat> so what we're seeing for the, for the retail sector is, um, you know, in the, in, the, in the last year, we have seen negative rental reversions. This was uh, in part due to the lower rates and as well as uh, some a change in uh, leasing strategies where the landlords actually allow um, you know, lower base rents with correspondingly higher GTO rents in the first year and the lower base rents will escalate um, over the second and third year of the lease. So of this, as a, as a, mathemat as a mathematical consequence, the, there were some negative rental reversions um, recorded. So when we talk to the REITs, uh, we understand that the GTO variable component for the new and renewed leases ranges about 5 to 20% ten of tenants' GTO. And some leases were also renewed on a 100% um, turnover basis. So we expect retailers to reevaluate their business models to optimize their online versus offline operations, as well as reconsider the value added from having retail presence. So nonetheless, we think the dominant and well-located um, and well-managed malls will be prioritized amidst the, the retail consolidation. And particularly, we think that the suburban will continue to do better than the central um, as, as they will benefit from the increased daytime population from permanent uh, hybrid work arrangements. In terms of the RSI, December RSI, uh, excluding motor vehicles was down by about 3.2%. Um, this is also very similar to the, the rate at which the REITs tend tenant sales have recovered, so it's, it's within the five negative 5% 5 range. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So now on to your hospitality subsector. Um, for hospitality, uh, the official data <clears throat> has for December as well as the full year 2020 has not been released. Uh, however, we understand that um, the Singapore Hotel Association, uh, some of their member hotels have actually um, reported increased bookings in the December school holiday period, the festive period as well. Um, and they have also benefited from the redemption of Singapore Rediscover vouchers. 
So some of the member hotels have actually reported occupancies of 60 to 75 percent. This compares to the occupancy in November, which was about 54 percent. And some hotels were also fully booked in December during the festive period. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, there are about 30 to 70 hotels uh, at any one time serving as designated facilities for, for quarantine purposes or stay home notice. Um, however, uh, we understand from the REITs that the block booking rates have bottomed. So initially they were better, they were better towards the start of the, the March, April period. However, as the, as the year progresses, as the COVID situation progresses, the government has actually sort of negotiated down the block booking rates. So right, right, right where we are now, um, the REITs are, think that there will be, you know, we have sort of reached the bottom of, of these block contract rates and it will not fall further. So this will affect um, the Far East Hospitality. Uh, they have about six out of nine of their hotels which are under this block booking, as well as um, for CDL HTIP. In terms of um, international visitor arrival, your IVAs, <clears throat> the IVA in January was down still by about 98.6%. 98 so, however, um, if you look at the sheer numbers, uh, the actual numbers, um, December and January arrivals actually averaged um, 23, uh, almost 24,000. And this is a 68% increase over October and November's 14,000 average. So high profile events held in Singapore, such as the World Economic Forum, which will be held in August of 2021, as well as um, the Geo Connect Asia, which will be held in March. Um, these higher profile events that are held on a, on a hybrid physical as well as virtual uh, platform or format will signal the confidence in Singapore's ability to host international events in a safe way. So hopefully um, Singapore will be one of the earlier countries in which which will see mice demand return. And if you look at the graph on your left, this is the number of people vaccinated per 100, well, per 100 persons. And um, major economies such as the, the US and the UK are leading the way in the immunization rates. So for the UK, um, it's currently the, the country with the highest um, number of people vaccinated per 100 people. So that's 20, 26 people followed by US, which is about 18 people. Uh, next slide, please. So these are our, our stock calls. <clears throat> so we are actually, um, in terms of subsector preference, we prefer the retail as well as the hospitality subsectors. Uh, and okay, this is because we believe that uh, these two subsectors will be, the, will be the first to benefit from the economic reopening and the vaccine rollout has improved visibility, which is expected to lift the share price overhang for the hospitality rates. So that's all for me. <clears throat> I'll pass the time on to uh, Paul. Okay, thanks, Natalie. Uh, mo move on to comfort the ghost fourth quarter results. Um, the title of the, the report was more uh, returning to core profitability. Uh, so if you, when you look at the, first thing we look at the positives, uh, you, uh, you can't really see the numbers here because you know, we really we usually display year on year, but uh, what was positive was on a quarter on quarter basis, the EBITDA or operating, or the EBIT, sorry, or operating profit uh, swung to profitability from a loss in the third quarter. Uh, and more important is uh, uh, excluding government relief. The, the res results for this quarter is, is is pretty hard to analyze because there's a lot of relief, uh, as you can see from the commentary. So we, uh, the better way is just to strip off the, this relief. Uh, and what was driving the EBIT to profitability, at, at least on a quarter on quarter basis, was taxi. So taxi was loss making and then returned to a, at least a 10 million net profit, uh, ex again uh, excluding the government relief. The, the other positive for us was the cash flows. So the net cash uh, actually rose for, from 64 million to 280 million. So strangely, after the, uh, after the pandemic, actually their balance sheet even became stronger. Uh, um, one of the reasons was the free cash flow uh, rose about 500 million up from almost 400 uh, from FY19. Uh, in terms of the negatives, the, the issue and actually even surprises was the public transport. So public transport refers to the bus and MRT. So we were expecting at least the EBIT, early operating profit to improve quarter and quarter since there is an opening, reopening, but it actually weakened. Uh, there weren't much details, but we think they were undergoing some major repairs at the SBS, uh, at the SBS uh, level. 
Uh, the other negative was the dividends. Uh, dividends just got, got massacred. Uh, it's like slash 85% plunge from uh, 1.43 cents to full year to this year, 1.43. Uh, and there was no interim dividend. So there's only one final dividend, which is 1.43. And uh, I mean, the peer ratios can compute. Uh, in terms of the outlook, I think uh, for us, 2021 will obviously be a recovery year. Uh, supported by you no know, uh, reopening. Uh, there's this curious thing about fuel indexation. Uh, what happens is fuel prices do higher fuel prices do uh, benefit them on the uh, on the bus side, and also the lower tax uh, actually it's, it's the lower taxi rebate. Sorry, as a, a typo there. So uh, any one of the in terms of the taxis, this would be the one that can help drive the recovery the most. Uh, and because the the what has happened is that if the rental waivers comfort dished out uh, in twenty twenty uh, is an estimate because they don't really give the exact number it's probably about hundred million for twenty twenty one according to our estimate uh, uh, is in our report but uh, we uh, so far they're going to give out rebates for to the taxi drivers in the first quarter so far only in the first quarter about thirteen million so you can see the the, the big change the hundred to thirteen million. And uh, and also the improvement in in real, but even that the real is still weak because it's still down year on year. Uh, we still maintain our buy no change in the target price, and for us, uh, comfort is the is the our proxy to uh, basically the recovery uh, for the for the whole Singapore economy, and of course the strong balance sheet. Uh, we continue to generate a lot of cash flows despite uh, this this pandemic. Uh, next slide. Oh, 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 sorry. Uh, uh, this is just to show you okay, the the longer term issue. I think we all know is this blue line, which is the comfort delgo fit, uh, uh, which is from one look away you you can always kind of conclude it's almost like on a structural decline. Uh, the one positive, uh, the one thing that there are two ways they're going to offset this. Of course, is to grow overseas, uh, and uh, not taxi, but at least on, on the buses and so forth. Uh, the other offset for them is that the composition of the taxi is changing more to hybrid. Uh, the, there are two reasons why hybrid is is preferred. Uh, hybrid will give you higher taxi rentals, I think about hundred and twenty plus. And the reason is because the the drivers can uh, can have fuel savings when they use a hybrid. Uh, the second positive, the second positive with hybrid is that according to them, is their lower maintenance because less moving parts and so forth. So that's why uh, moving into hybrid is a is a core strategy for them. Uh, right now is about sixty percent. They probably want to do it full full hybrid by 2023. Uh, the other thing is that's, uh, the, the chart on the right is just to show you the rebound in in in, in, in real traffic uh, won't be as high because so long as we still have a lot of work, office workers at, at the work from home status. Okay, uh, next slide. Okay, uh, we'll move on to, to Starhub. The, the type is, um, for us, it was about all about cost control, the way they, how, how they managed to maintain the, the EBITDA, uh, at least the services EBITDA. And in terms of the, the positives for us was the cost. I think uh, you can see from the table on the left, revenue dropped 5%, no, roughly 5%, 4.8%. But they also managed to lower their operating costs by 4.7%. I mean, it's not easy to do because this is, you know, there's a lot of heavy fixed costs involved in this business. So what they did was, of course, the pay TV content. They also lowered uh, uh, customer acquisition and marketing costs and also the, uh, the natural lower uh, traffic costs. Uh, in terms of the other positive for us was somewhat similar to, to Comfort, but I guess to a lesser extent was the cash flow they generated. It was about uh, 37 million, a slight improvement from a year ago. And the balance sheet is also again stronger coming out from the pandemic. Uh, the negative is is clearly the roaming pain, the roaming revenue, the loss of roaming revenue, and you can see it uh, in the mobile revenue. If you look at the box, the mobile revenue, sorry, it's a bit small, but uh, mobile revenue dropped a huge 30 30 percent uh, because of the ARPU. Uh, because without the roaming revenue, you basically have. Uh, there's no no additional apu uplift for you, so your apu will go to record lows of thirty dollars. Uh, the other thing was the dividends or slash, so they give a final dividend of two point five full year about five. So but the pre pri previous year the dividend was nine cents, so this is like a forty four percent drop. The guidance they give uh, for dividend in twenty twenty one is at least five cents. So so the 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 a consolation for this uh, at least a, the slight positive for this stock is that. You are getting a four percent yield, you know, as you know, as you are waiting for this recovery to, or roaming revenues to return. 
So at least you're paid 4%. Um, the one other negative for us that we were also quite surprised was PTV. So PTV, uh, uh, as you recall in 2019, uh, it's a bit long, but uh, 2019 they did the fiber where they cut all the, uh, sorry, they cut cable and move everyone to fiber. Uh, so we thought that the pay TV subscribers should at, at least uh, be stable, but we were surprised that there was quite a big, a uh, reasonably big churn of 7,000. Uh, they lost 7,000 subscribers. Uh, this is higher than the 3,000 in, in third quarter 20. Uh, they didn't really say much, but we need to monitor this. Uh, the other thing is the, the out, outlook. Uh, outlook will be weak in 2021 uh, because uh, they will have another quarter, so next quarter, first quarter 21, uh, I mean this March quarter, you will see another set of weak numbers because they don't have the roaming. Again, they will have the year-on-year -year roaming weakness. Then you will get uh, less uh, uh, GSS support and then you get a sluggish pay TV uh, revenue that, that we just mentioned, which was a surprise for us. Uh, the positive is civil is cybersecurity. Uh, if you look at the table uh, again, you can on this, you can see that cybersecurity fourth quarter jump about sixty percent. But the 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 problem, I mean, the near term problem at least for cybersecurity is the margins are very low. The net margin is only one percent. Uh, you know, one percent is like distributed margins. But but of course, the growth is really strong, and they just need to to at least get the scale, uh, ho hopefully, and get the operating leverage. Uh, so the outlook is really about how to contain costs. Okay, uh, in terms of our view, we maintain neutral and change target price. Uh, we have this benchmarking it to six times EV EBITDA. Uh, okay, let's move, move on to the last portion, which is our usual weekly. Uh, in terms of the macro, actually a lot of the latest macro data actually has been positive uh, from Singapore and even the US, but let's move on to uh, Singapore first. In terms of the exports, the exports was, was, uh, was, was really strong. I think we were up 13%. And in, in a lot of it came from electronics. Uh, it's also up 13 uh, and then uh, in terms of the Singapore budget, I think we came up with a short note. Uh, I think mo most of the items we can, we only more most of us knows, but uh, most of us know. But in terms of the impact to the market, uh, for us was the fiscal deficit was two percent. So this is positive in the sense that you know we're going to get this this big economic rebound in twenty twenty one. But at the same time, the government is still willing to you know, do provide deficit spending. Uh, the rest is not uh, they are not they're spending more on jobs. In terms of the near-term beneficiaries, uh, will be healthcare because there's they've allocated uh, funds. Uh, I think three billion. I think uh, for, at least for uh, PCR for testing and uh, and and the vaccination process. And of course, you know, like someone like QNM will benefit because they're doing the PCR test. Uh, also, transport will benefit. I think they're providing almost hundred and thirty-three million uh, taxi re uh, relief to taxi drivers. So obviously this will benefit uh, Comfort because there are taxi drivers now are getting uh, relief by the government. Uh, of course, including the issues, I guess, including the competitor too, which is Grab. Uh, the longer term benefit for us was construction and building materials. We will show you a chart later. Uh, um, in terms of the, this one final point, in terms of the US, the big number was retail sales. Uh, it was a huge number that came out in January, a very positive uh, retail sales. Uh, retail sales in the US jumped almost 6%. And also uh, to a record almost 450 billion. Uh, one of the reasons is the you know, the stimulus, uh, the the recent second round stimulus, where almost every individual get, or child gets about 600 per in, adult. Uh, so so what we can can gather from this is that probably the money are like the first round of stimulus is, has not been saved or used to repay that, but I guess it has been spent. Uh, you can see from the the big jump, and the money this time was also dispersed faster. Uh, in terms of technical view, we are still positive on the market. Uh, we're still looking at the rally on the cyclical rebound globally and of course the huge global growth. Uh, I think the events you can watch uh, in terms of uh, Poland's webinar. Uh, so this Wednesday, we will have MM2 Asia. Uh, I guess you can ask them about the whole rights issue or, and the attractiveness of it. Uh, we will also have Pop next the following week and the rest. Uh, we also added a Star Hub. So Star Hub will be coming but on the end of uh, uh, 30th March. Uh, uh, credit bureau uh, in, in and so far I, I think uh so if you're interested uh feel free to just it's open to everyone you can just feel free to just log into our phones web speed web page and and log into the event seminar and of course it's a chance for you to ask questions directly on to this question uh to these companies uh next slide uh, uh, as usual we do a quick update so this is a very positive chart in the sense that the pandemic numbers are coming down the daily cases and, and this is even without the, the vaccination is only two months, but we're already back to four-month low. 
I don't think this is due to the vaccination. This is just a lot of lockdowns and so forth. And maybe less strict testing maybe in certain countries. Uh, so, so this is positive that the pandemic is contracting. Uh, next slide. For, for Singapore, uh, ignore the title, so it's, uh, it's an error there, but uh, we only had one community case, whereas the prior week it was uh, where it was seven the prior. So we are having a good, uh, you'll be watching uh, after the festive season, how the numbers uh, trend two weeks. Uh, so uh, again, like the minister just mentioned, you know, the recovery, just a reminder, depends on the trajectory of the pandemic. So that's why we are monitoring the pandemic because this would, uh, in a way, can influence the economic recovery. Uh, I, th I think the rest we can read. Uh, the next slide. Just one final slide for me. Uh, in terms of the budget, uh, the we noticed that actually defense budget, actually defense expenditure in for the Singapore budget actually jumped. So it's jumped to almost 15%, uh, 13%. So this is going to be a record expenditure on defense, which uh, I mean, we can kind of allude that this is going to be positive for ST engineering. Of course, not all the revenues come from this, but it, it is a, definitely a positive for them. Uh, the other thing will be the, the construction projects. Uh, so the rate, the chart on the right is the uh, construction contracts from the public sector alone. So public sector maybe uh, average maybe twelve billion. So if they do launch this uh, Singa uh, con uh, Singa bonds ninety billion, if you do that, you know rough maths is about six billion a year. So this is quite a, a meaningful amount of awards coming up, and you know included is that hundred billion to to the the so called sea wall. So. Longer term, it does look like the construction contracts from the public sector at least is going to be well supported uh, from this 90 billion and also from the 19 billion of green projects. Uh. So, so uh, I mean, this we, we can't uh, we'll give a precise number how much comes out every year because we, will, we don't really know. But but uh, at least from the longer term trajectory, it is good for construction and also building materials. So I think that, that comes to the end of my presentation. Uh, uh, feel free to ask any questions uh, at the Q&A tab. Uh. Thank you everyone for, for listening. Okay, I think I think we'll just answer the questions uh, that, that you're submitting. Thanks for submitting the questions uh, here. Okay, I think there's one question on uh, BRC Asia. I'll just read out the question. What was Lee Metal historical PE? Why should BRC Asia historical PE be higher than that? So, uh, Lee, Metal, Lee Metal's we, we don't have Lee Metals, uh, the, the, the P for, for Lee Metal of, after acquisition, of course, but for their uh, P before the acquisition, they were trading at 18 and a half times and 26 and a half times, FY16 and FY17. Of course, they were acquired in FY17. Now. So 18 and a half, 26 and a half times, uh, PE was Lee Metals historical. Uh, we think BRC Asia should trade at a higher uh, PE than that than, than their own average 13 times because the consolidation the, the acquisition really consolidated BRC's uh, market share position and I mean I mean like, like what we, we mentioned during the, the presentation they, they they now have more than two thirds of the market share 70 percent uh, of the mesh and steel reinforcement uh, um, of the market share in Singapore, so 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 is they essentially, uh, they, they almost have the, the market share of the whole market, la. So 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 with that kind of um market power, we think they they, they deserve to be trading at a higher, uh, historical PE than their their ten year average, which is about thirteen, la. So so we we think we think we 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 packed it at eleven. We think we think we think it should be about if, even if, if if they relate to about thirteen times that's, 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 that gives us a TP of about uh two two dollars and twenty cents. But we 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 just pegging it a little bit lower because of the uncertain environment. Uh, but 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 to to I think the answer is a bit long. But to give you to give you a short answer, it's it's because their their market positions uh, strengthened considerably after the acquisition. Yeah, let me know if if, if I answer your question. Thanks. Then there's one more question here. Uh, any particular companies that will benefit from construction and building materials contracts due to Singa and green projects underway? So uh, we, I think at, at the moment we have we, we have one coverage that we just initiated on BRC Asia. So BRC Asia is 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 a clear beneficiary of the 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 
the the the the move to 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 issue these these bonds and also to to increase the amount of construction activity in Singapore. Yeah. Uh, Terence, you have covered BRC, but what about Pen United? Any comments? Uh, we we at this moment we we uh have no coverage on Pen United. But, but I, I think some of, my, some of my colleagues may, may have so have some comments on PenU. So maybe I leave it to them to chime in for this question. Uh, then there's one also. Any change in ST Engineering TP after the current results announcement? We, we don't have any uh, uh, rating on, on ST Engineering at the moment. Yeah. Okay, I, I think I, I let the rest chime in. Thanks. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, let, let me just, just help out on the Penn United. So, if assuming a scenario where I mean we not not hundred percent clear because we, this is just based on what was announced in the budget, but assuming construction really can sustain you know, uh, uh, some a good order flow, the 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 better way to play at least from our point of view is building materials because you know you don't have to. The main reason because most of these building material companies like Penn U or even like Terence mentioned a BRC. Have huge market share. They're like uh, Penn U maybe of forty, then uh, BRC about seventy. So you don't have to worry who wins what contract. So long as they are contracts, they will get their share. Uh, so Penn U is really made concrete. They got forty percent market share, and it's a very high barrier to add to entry business when I mean, you do ready mix. First, you got to get a cement terminal. Uh, I don't. Nobody's going to give you the cement cement terminal. These are huge investments. You, I know these terminals are you not know, like. Almost I see front view of myself, build a build a nice con a nice sea front condo and give you a turn. So these are very rare assets to get. Then you have to build silos, then you have to get the infrastructure because uh, ready mixed concrete is, is delivered every two hours. So because these are like wet concrete, you cannot leave them on, on the road for two hours. So there's high barriers. So for us, building materials is a better way to play if you believe that the construction contracts will be will remain vibrant the next few years. Uh, in, in, let me just address the the first question. Uh, so th thanks again for all your questions. Uh, there is a big uh, there is a big persistent concern about. Uh, let me read it out. Sorry, there's a big persistent concern about increasing inflation and a bubble burst for the US market, which will significantly impact STI. What's your advice? Uh, and what can we do to mitigate our risk when invested mainly in SG or Hong Kong stocks? Okay, it, uh, uh, it is important to think into uh, context the recent rise in bond yields. I think before uh, end 2019, uh, before we went into this pandemic, I mean, bond yields were about 1.9. Let, let's say we use 2%, I mean, roughly. And right now, we are 1.4. So the, the climb isn't, isn't that alarming in that sense because we are almost going back to the norm of, of, of 1.9. So, so that's point number one. And uh, number two, uh, what people worry about inflation is how the Fed will react. And, and we all know they... they so long as unemployment is still high, they are very unwilling to react. Uh, so whatever in, in reaction you get from the from the Fed will be very lack impact because they they've been fooled before. There was they were think, expecting inflation and it never happened. You know, the last ten years. So and and, and they got almost like a social calling that they want to keep unemployment low. So uh, unless unemployment really drops down to back to four percent, then any you probably see them reacting. Uh, I mean, there are more other technical things like PCE above two percent sustain level, but we don't go there. And the third thing is that for equities, you might get uh, the initial flows. It's always hard to predict, but you might get the initial flows moving out of bonds into into equity, because when rates rise on worries of inflation, I think then you know, you're going to get bond losses. So that could be the other offset. Uh, if if you're talking about beneficiary of in rising interest rates, the, the obvious one would be the banks. Uh, so if if rates rise and then you got strong growth, uh, it's almost a, like a perfect scenario for the Singapore banks. That means every engine is running because right now the banks, you know, growth is coming back, but margins are low and so forth. So if you got strong growth and you got rising interest rates, then you got strong loans growth, wide, uh, higher margins. Uh, and then get the fee income and, and so forth. Uh, sorry, that's a very long answer, but but that's uh, that's what we think about the thing. I, I so I'm not sure if I really helped your answer, but that's my my comment. Thanks. Uh, let's move on to the rest. Uh, Natalie, before we take on the the, the te technicals. Uh, 
Oh, okay, so for for me, I think I see a question here um, asking about uh, bond yields creeping up. <clears throat> so I believe that the US Treasury yields are the ones that have been um, sort of on the upward trend. Uh, and so the question is actually, um, bond yields creeping up, do you, see, you seem to be very optimistic on the REITs or should we be wary from now on? Um, yeah, so yeah, yes, I think the US um, Treasury yields have been uh, creeping up. However, if you look at the for, for our Singapore REITs at least, um, they, they tend to adopt a very, um, uh, or try to adopt a more um, evenly distributed debt profile, such that, you know, not their, their debt expiry or maturity is actually spread out across a few years. So of course that will help the REITs, but in, in any case, um, we are more concerned with the, the Singapore um, interest rates and even the Singapore interest rates, um, as mentioned, the 10-year SGSU, the 10-year bond yield, has um, sort of increased by almost uh, 24 basis points um, just in the last week due to the budget. Um, that said, most of our most of the REITs, um, most of the loans actually are, are priced based on the three-month saw. So that's one thing, uh, which as, which has not really moved much yet. Uh, another thing is, of course, the REITs now are, apart from the very ev evenly distributed um, debt structures, which means that at any one time of the year, of the of the period, um, you know, depending on on their on their on how they manage their loans, uh, up to perhaps thirty three percent could be could be refinanced. So that will actually help to even out the distribute the the risk when it comes to interest rates increasing, and. You know, there's, there's a trend right now for the REITs to actually adopt or rather take on some uh, sustainability loans or green loans. So that also, uh, in a sense, will help the REITs. But to, to, to some things up, um, yes, um, when it comes to rising interest rates, that will affect the financing costs for REITs. But presently, I think, given they are trending towards green loans, as well as their willingness to take on a little bit higher um, gearing, um, that should still lead to uh, accretive acquisitions for the REITs, which we believe that the REITs are still on an acquisition um, spree. Yeah, so, so we still think that, you know, it is manageable for now. There's also another question here on um, Far East Hospitality Trust. So for Far East Hospitality, um, you know, they have nine, they have nine, they are, they are Singapore focused, 100% Singapore focused. Nine of their assets are actually hotels. There are four service residences. So for, for, for them, all of their assets are on master leases. So the, typically the structure is like there's a portion of fixed rents, uh, rather guaranteed rents, a base. And then they also share in the, the, the profitability of, of their assets. <clears throat> so far East um, Hospitality on a full year, they were, still, they were also down because uh, in terms of their revenues as well as their DPU, they were down. DPU was down by almost uh, 37%. Um, and of course, this was largely attributed to uh, lower rentals from their master leases due to the absence or, of um, you know, your variable, variable component of the rent. Um, set six out of nine of their hotels are currently uh, under block bookings uh, with the government. That said, they also have three Sentosa assets, um, you know, which, which could potentially benefit from staycation demand, although two of them are currently still on block booking. <coughs> yeah. So we like Pacify East because of their, of their fixed, um, the fixed portion of their, uh, sorry, the, the master leases for, for most of their assets. Um, however, in terms of like uh, be benefiting from mice demand, so as you know, Far East Hospitality, some of their assets, which include like uh, Orchard Rendezvous, and and th these are all um, you know mid tier kind of as assets. So they do not really have a very large um, you know conference facility, or and that they might not be able to benefit in that sense from any mice demand because even even as the mice demand comes back to Singapore, you know it still might be um, held in in you know hotels with with bigger uh, mice capabilities and so that the, you know, the, the arriving delegates and et cetera, they all can be sort of housed in one, one asset or maybe you know, even spread up uh, between two assets, uh, but mo mostly they try to contain it within a, a, a specific place. So in terms of mice demand, we think that you know, Fais Hospitality might not be able to capture some of the returning mice demand. Yeah. So, that that's it. Um, you know, this year, this year itself, the negative, you know, 40 percent in DPU, um, 
it will only go up from here because as, as the economy reopens and as more of their assets are taken off this uh, government block booking, you know, there is potential for, for an increase in, in revenue in the sense. So this is like the, the low that we expect from IPHG. Okay, so that's about it for Paris Hospitality. I see a lot of um, technical questions, but I think there's also one for Sehui on Yoma. So perhaps we take the fundamental questions first. Okay, yeah, um, there's a question on Yoma, so I'll just read it out. Um, do you think our TP for Yoma is realistic in view of the sanction and the FDI negative impact? And um, taking into consideration from the previous coup, um, what will be the impact in assuming the same magnitude of sanction? So um, for this, um, our last report on Yoma was 5th of February, right at the beginning, right at the beginning when the coup started. So previously we actually had some hope that the political situation in Myanmar would improve. So we only have we only factored in the reduction of selling um we only factored in the reduction of property prices um and also um currency impact. But since then um the situation in Myanmar actually escalated very quickly. Uh the peaceful protests actually became more violent and there are actually more shootings and um deaths now. So um, apart and also um apart from um US targeted sanctions against the top military brass, I think um if I'm not wrong, Myanmar is actually now seeing um Britain's asset freezes and also travel bans. Uh Canada is also going to take action against nine military officials. So um the situation still remains very fluid and uh there, if I'm not wrong also, there wasn't a previous coup of this scale in nature before as a president, so we, ha we haven't been able to gauge the impact. But um, we are looking to revise our forecast and target price again, uh, given the escalation of events. Yeah, so this is all for Yoma. Yeah, and we just, just to, to, to help uh, Chi Chen Hui, I think, uh, I think we have to be realistic. I mean, in the near term, uh, there is no good sin, no good outcome in the near term. I mean, uh, I mean, both sides are, uh, you know, the protests and the military. Uh, we, we can, I mean, rationally, we can kind of conclude that there isn't going to be anything positive in the near term. It's going to be something explosive to resolve this. Nothing can resolve. I just, I think something really drastic, which is more likely to be some negative event. Yeah, uh, I think for us, finally, we still like the company, but of course, this kind of uh, clouds everything. Obviously, is beyond our our beyond our expectations. Yeah, yeah. But our views, uh, it, yeah. And there's no real po nothing positive going to come out in the near term. There's probably going to be one major negative event. Uh, let me just just quickly rush through one more question before I go to the. Um, how how does the comfort Delgo benefit from higher fuel and indexation? Uh, isn't fuel indexation a pass through mechanism? Uh, they, they is. Okay, when it comes to the bus uh, bus services, uh, they are paid a service fee and included in that service fee is some margin on the fuel price. They, they've never disclosed at all. Uh, you, you will see in every results uh, when that comes out, the announcement, there will always be a mention of fuel indexation. But even when analyst briefings, they, they will, because these are all confidential arrangements with the government, but I think fair to say that there is some margin on the fuel. They, we do not know the pre pre precise number. We don't know the content because they, they do not disclose because all confidential uh, agreement with the authorities. But uh, it just say, it's just that they just, uh, we've been just uh, told that it's kind of like when fuel rises, they will get some margin out of it. I'm, I'm only assuming this, they probably get some percentage margin from the fuel. But, but fuel is definitely passed through. I mean, they don't take what they're doing. They're just getting a fee from, you know, from just driving in driving kilometers uh, yeah. uh, I hope that I'm a bit hard because there's not much clarity even on our end because it's not disclosed so just as much as we, we know ourselves yeah thanks yeah maybe I, I, I chime in with one, one, one of the questions here uh, another we have another question on on uh, Myanmar so maybe I'll just, just, just add on also so the question is could you comment on Sam top industries amid the current situation in Myanmar so I think the for Sam top Industries, some of them may know, they operate a 225 megawatt gas-fired power plant in Mandalay, Myanmar. Uh, they, 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 the, 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 the power plant commenced operations in 2018. Uh, from, from what we understand from them, there has been no uh, disruption and the, the power plant is still operating at full capacity. La. So the, 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 anyway, the, the total book value of the facility is about 57 million US dollars. So, um, not extremely big. 
uh, and 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 they, they didn't provide any more further details lah. We just know there's no disruption in, in for the, the power plant. Uh, Sapcorp will also be reporting their full year twenty results tomorrow, so we will provide a, an update and, and we will we'll highlight the, the Myanmar situation, uh, in, in our our presentation next week. Yeah, thank you. Um, I saw some of the technical questions, so I'll just go through one by one before I hand back to my colleagues. So I think the first question was on the outlook of the bank. So I assume it's the three banks that we are looking at. So first of all, we go to UOB. Uh, as you can see that UOB has, uh, we have tested the resistance zone uh, once, um, I think three times. Uh, you can, you can, Actually, you can interpret it as a triple top, but um, in this case, I won't, uh, first of all, uh, because I think every time you test it, you have a short fall, and then you make a high low. So uh, in this case, I would say that it's more like an ascending triangle, or you can say it's a wedge, a uh, mini for, for, uh, rising wedge that may go into correction. Uh, in any way, if there's a correction, I think that the immediate support zone at $22.89 will likely be holding, uh, which, which is the one, uh, one one point two three six percent extension of the whole, uh, this double top. Uh, after it broke off the from the flag, um, but I think that um, given the inside bar today, uh, if it close within a bullish bar, um, not closing below um twenty three point four two, I think there's a chance that it might it might invalidate this resistance zone one, uh, between twenty three dollar and ninety seven cents. All right, uh, and then you will test um, the higher the higher like the high resistance zone at 25.22 to 25.69 okay so this is what i have in mind so the next one uob uob has also the same scenario with what um i, I mean ocbc has the same scenario as uob so ocbc right um tested a lot uh, i think this is more like a, a compact testing of the immediate resistance zone uh, but however, I think that even it breaks up, I think it reached my target of eleven dollars, uh, to eleven dollar and thirteen cents. I think I highlighted in one of the report last year or January, uh, which I can't remember. Uh, so once it breaks the upper boundary of the resistance zone at ten dollars seventy four cents, then we might see that uh price will be heading off on the upside. Um, then move on to DBS. I I think DBS is a bit uh weird. Uh, I think. Uh, more clear cut. I think DBS has been leading all both both the banks in in terms of uh, the exponential uh up rise movement. Uh, however, you can see that there's a potential head and shoulder formation. Uh, we still pending the the break breakdown of the neckline support at around twenty five dollars to twenty four dollars and seventy seven cents. Um, but what I can know right from this is. Uh, there's a there seems to be a declining volume from the head to the right shoulder, so it, it's it's kind of like a a a, a give you a increased probability of the uh chance that head and shoulders is happening, but um it's still we still need to pending a break. So once you pending a break, I think we will we will look at this resistance and support level, uh at twenty two point nine nine or even slightly force breakout to twenty two point two three. Otherwise, I think that this level is going to hold at 21.24 uh, in, in the long run. It should. This um, this is, uh, head and shoulder being, it is forming up. All right. So the next one, I think, wait, let's, okay. So SDI, I think SDI, I really shared last week. Uh, there's a head and shoulder. Um, like uh, there's a bearish flag. So likely there's a break below. So, but uh, right now it's being supported at higher end of the 28,000. Uh, 700, uh, 8, 600 region, uh, which you can see over here. Uh, but I think that the weak momentum should it continue persist in this coming week. I think we will should, we will be likely to find support uh, below slightly below 2008 uh, with a higher end of 2007, uh, which can highlight from my chart is 2762 to 2784 region uh, before a rebound. Okay, so um, likely likely will be seeing uh, further downside. So, uh, but if there's upside, I think uh, the upside will be kept at 3055 to 3121 uh, again. So um, either way, I think we are looking for a neutral type of like um, uh, momentum. So it's a range trading lacking of momentum for the SDI. Uh, compared to Hang Seng, I think Hang Seng has been uh, going up for a strong, strong while, all right? Okay, so the next one before I pass back my colleague, 
uh, I think I'll go through like a sender, a sender CRCT and escort. So uh, CRCT, if you look at it, um, I like to use this Ichimoku indicator. Shows that uh, how strong the bearish trend is. Uh, we just had a, a Kumo twist today. So it, uh, it means that uh, either the upside will be kept at uh, $2.10 resistance and then followed by a sell down to um to this one dollar ninety five cent to one dollar ninety one cents uh support term, um support zone sorry so uh anyway you can see that the on the upper uh end of the uh of the ascending web you can see that this rounding top um is actually has been taken formation so it has break away break the neckline support at two dollar ten cents uh quite strongly um uh, last Friday. So therefore, I think if you look at the death cross and the lagging span breaking below the candles, um, we are looking at uh, further downside for this. I think uh, ascendant street. I think last. I think for a few time, I say that uh, although there's a safety net that uh, as long as price stay above three dollars zero five, uh, we are safe. But uh, I do mention that be cautious about it because I think it, it first it fills us a gap already. Second, there's a multiple testing. Uh, back uh, $3.05. So therefore, this resistance and support actually has been weakened. And then therefore, it has been broken down. So uh, if you can look at that, um, I think the Ichimoku signal has already signaled uh, a change in trend already. All right. So I think um, lagging span is down. I think if tomorrow there's a persistent downside, then I think that the next support will be at uh, $2.70. And then it confirmed the three barrier death cross already. In, in this in, in this retrospect. And then this whole upside it will be considered as a as a false breakout movement. All right. And so lastly about uh escort. Uh escort also display the same kind of um signal, bearish signal uh from the Ichimoku signals. So um do they it just slightly breaks up close uh open and then uh is attempt to pray um press below the the uh the the kumo. So once it really goes down all the way down, then we can confirm the bearish signal. So the support zone uh, at zero point eight six five to zero point eight nine five will be the 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 best uh area to look out at. Uh, is actually the the extension level of two point six one eight of this double top, and then three uh is like um three times the size of this double top. And then at the same time, if you if I if you are going to look at the retracement, immediate retracement, it confluence um this 2.618 and 3 extension confluence with the retracement at 0 0.7860. So therefore, I think that uh price will make uh further downside before rebound, and the rebound will likely be kept as well in the future at this resistance zone between 1.15 to 1.19. All right, so with that, I'm done with my uh sharing. So I pass my time back to my colleague. Thank you. Hello everyone. Uh, so I will be talking a little bit about the FSL initiation because there are two questions uh, about the whether uh, about the FSL initiation. So I will be answering the first one, just giving a brief um, introduction. Then with regards to the second question, uh, maybe I will um, I have I'll have to look back on the financial model and post the answer on stocks BNB. So um, with regards to the initiation for first ship lease trust, we think that the major investment this is for this is the high um, distribution you projected for FY21, which is 47%. Uh, and this is relatively similar to the distribution you for FY20, which is 46.2%. So um, for the company, they disposed of, um, I think around eight uh, vessels in total um, in the whole, throughout the whole of FY20. Then for FY21, they are going to dispose of two brand new um, long range two product tankers and possibly um, a few other tankers that are not under the fixed rate bare boat charters. So that's why um, this, this is the reason for the high distribution yield for that. And that's why the total return is 71% uh, as stated in the report. Yeah, so with regards to the second question, um, yeah, as I mentioned previously, I'll be um have to I will have to look back on the model and post the answer on stocks BNB. Yeah, thank you.
Uh, is there any more questions? If not, uh, by uh, you guys. If not, I'll take on the venture one and the SIA before I pass back to you. Uh, yep. Uh, there was a question for Weekwang on DBS. Um, the question is, can you comment on DBS uh, concern of exposure on on the legal legal in India? Okay, so basically Weekwang is um engaged at the moment. He's on a, on another call. Um, I will read out the answer that he has typed. Um, his response to this question uh, on, on the legal issues in India <clears throat> is, we can only wait and see on the progress of the potential lawsuit, but ultimately the India business take up, takes up a small part of DBS business, and they have already taken up uh, more provisions to cater for financial risk. So political and legal risk may also square evenly on both Reserve Bank of India as well as DBS. <clears throat> I'm sorry, there's also another question asking uh, where, where, can you, where you can find this video. So the recording of this video can be found on our website, um, www.stocksbnb.com. <clears throat> yeah, so that's all. Uh, we're in can then, go Okay, then I'll take on, uh, just give me a moment. Um, so venture, right? Um, so venture, um, the technical really don't really social much. I think you can see that this is a very large uh, head and shoulder uh, pattern potentially. All right. So um, I think I still, this, this support zone between 17 to 22, I've been holding on since I've been, I've like some sort of like, uh, I believe that you traced it since like last year, I think back in October. Uh, when price was trending around here. So um, I think you see that the upside momentum, uh, if after it fails to clear above the, the sell, uh, this, um, this resistance line, um, there is a, there's a hinge here, I, I, I believe, uh, you will, will retest $21 again. And then how strong it tested, uh, really, really has to depend. I think uh, going forward, I think uh, in, intermediately, I think, um, Venture is still within the, the high, uh, is still below the high. So uh, whether any upsides uh, is really depends on uh, first how well this resistance is going to be tested uh, and then how well $21 is being uh, broken. So right now, I believe that um, immediate there will be an upside. Uh, if you look at the this, this Ichimoku, I think it's showing very range uh, type of training. So, uh, there isn't any any signal for mouth for venture so i'll i'll, I'll likely skip this all right so um can you give technical on baba dbs you'll be baba i'll give during my 1 p.m session since the us talk so i won't cover that here due to time constraint all right so i will cover it in the one at the 1 p.m so the last one i'll do is uh well that's a lot uh yang Zijiang. i think yang Zijiang, uh my my view from last week until now don't change um, I think it's still going to test this 1.13 to 1.16, uh, despite there's a correction. Um, I think if this 0 0.99 to $1 is being supported, I think you'll, you'll, you'll serve a strong rebound upside. Uh, otherwise, I think that Yang Zijiang in the long run right, uh, is going to be a uh, very range momentum type uh, after since it sell down. I think this, this triple three has, really com be com has been completed. Okay, so um, in regards to this, I think we we will stay put for now for Yang Zijiang. I think Yang Zijiang will be ranged about between one dollar nine one dollar ten cents or one dollar sixteen cents to zero point nine one region. Right, that that will be the range play that we are that I have in mind. Uh, next one is MacTech. I think MacTech. I think MacTech is currently testing a resistance zone once again, strong upside. Uh, likely we are going to test the next resistance zone in the long run at one dollar forty six to one dollar and fifty nine cents. Uh, one dollar forty nine cents to one dollar and fifty six cents. Um, sorry, sorry for the confusion. Uh, but provided I think that uh we are going to break one dollar twenty cents first. All right. So if it, it I, I think right now, if you can look at the uh, uh falling wedge, I think we have broken out. But the upside momentum is still a bit of concern. So therefore, I'm not very sure that um, what, what's the next 
next move forward. But I'm highly confident that this resistance zone one, after being tested so many times, it might be broken. But whether this resistance zone will hold or break, it will, it, it will be another question in the future. Okay. Okay, some power. I think some power will face slightly further more correction after it hit $1, $1 psychological high, all time high. And I think the next support will be around 0 0.735 to 0 0.760 uh, region. Uh, reason being is uh, I think that we have completed five wave, uh, theory, uh, five wave impulse wave. So right now, I think this, this, this three wave down, uh, you you know you won't see this one straight away going to to this support zone, but rather it will be a complex corrective wave, uh, likely a double tree or corrective flat, going forward. Uh, before that you before you come in here, so uh, maybe a double zigzag. All right. So but likely I'm I'm eyeing this support um zone at zero point seven three five to seven zero seven point seven six. Okay. And then G nine to last one before I hand up my colleagues. Uh, China aviation. I think China aviation. I think last week. I, I I think I think I did this before to one of you guys. So the routing top. Um, likely this a uh, corrective. Uh, rising wedge. Uh, likely we're seeing a uh, bearish momentum further further on the downside. Uh, unless you break uh break above one point two two and then close above one point two five. Then we will see that okay. Then we confirm the upside. Um, I think if you look at the Ichimoku indicator, perfectly ranging mom momentum. Uh, despite Senko span A is up, but I think that uh that pricing to still break further to, um to 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 bring forward the, the upside. Uh, reason why is because I think um uh, I think prices is still trending below uh Tenkan Sen and Sen uh, uh Kinju Sen, the baseline. And then after that, the the um lagging span is still within the candle. All right. So with that, I end off. Um. Uh, before I end off the presentation, I think um just want to ask Paul, do you have any question or do you have anything to add on before we end off the session for today? Uh yeah, I think there's still lots of questions that we 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 couldn't answer, but we will try to address this inflation thing. Uh, it's still heavy result season, but after that, maybe we will try to do some charts to just alleviate. <laughs> everyone's concern of a, a, a surge in inflation but you no know, do remember that inflation also means the ability to repay your debt is better so so do do be mindful of that too but, but anyway we'll try and address that and, and sorry we can't come cope with all the questions uh, because we have another event uh, there's one question on comfort uh the food index indexation negative impact yeah I, I think if you look at, at every results announcement they will always mention fuel indexation the most re uh, impacting negatively for this year so, so i hope that answers it quickly quickly for you. Uh, and we will, I know there's a lot of things about inflation, but for us, we think it's a hate figure, but, but we're trying to address it, if not next week, the following week, because still heavy results. But uh, anyway, uh, thanks everyone for, for attending. Uh, we hope it was, was helpful, and, and feel free to just type me any question you have on our website, at the top BNB, and we'll try to address it for you. Uh, thanks, and, and have a good, good week, and a good week ahead. Uh, thank you, everybody. See you next week. And, and do sign up for our MM2 on Wednesday, if you do have the time. Thanks, everyone.